Um, good day, my ancestral name is Khatsumeitsa. My English name is Candice Campo. I'm the owner operator of Talesi Tours, and I'd like to welcome you today to our Talking Trees tour. Where we are is the Capilano River Park, a beautiful park that is well utilized by both the locals and the visitors here on the North Shore. Where I'm standing is in front of the beautiful renowned sisters or known as the Lion Mountains. And we're about to embark in the trails today to explore the, the forest, the plants and the trees and um, the Aboriginal uses of the forest. Erica would like will share with you the, the story of the twin sisters. Referred to as the lions by some people, um, but they're also referred to as the sisters. Uh, we call them Chichioi. Chichioi? Chichioi. So the story involves um, the Caius brothers, which are supernatural beings that have the power to transform um, figures, mountains, things like that. It was many hundreds of years ago and our people here in this area would often war with northern tribes, um, the Kwakwakiwak being one. And the Kwakwakiwak had sent down a raid party and actually had taken the two daughters of a Siam, a chief. And he, <clears throat> the raid party was going back up the inlet and the daughters had actually fallen in love with the captors. Or, and um, the Transformers brothers, seeing this, um, had spoken to the daughters and what they wanted was peace and hope because our people had been warring for so many millennia. Um, and he transformed the sisters into these two mountains you see here for representation of peace and hope between the nations. So every time you look at that, you kind of are reminded Why is it called Talking Trees? Talking Trees? I coined it over 10 years ago and um, it's actually a very personal story but I'll share it. Um, growing up as a child I um, used to be just a very quiet child and I used to go in the forest and I can't say I talked to the trees but I actually felt I had a relationship with them and as I got older and learned a little bit more about the ecology and science of the forest. Forests actually do communicate with each other and within our culture um, we believe that plant life, animals and humans um, have a form of intelligence as well as a spirit so that's why I named it Talking Trees. I wanted to ask if you could touch upon the licorice root that's Absolutely. growing on the tree. I'll just uh, identify the, the fern, but um, this is called licorice fern and it's most commonly grown on the maple tree. Um, it needs a good soft bed of moss to be able to <coughs> grow its root systems. But you would typically harvest the licorice root in spring and summer season for the most potent medicinal qualities that it has. But uh, you would typically brew it into a tea. And if you have a sore throat or you're trying to get over a cold, it works wonders on your sore throat. You can actually harvest the, the root and eat it plain or raw. And it works as like an appetite suppressant. So a lot of time in the summer, our women would be out in the mountainside picking berries and of course you'd have to bring your children along with you um, and you would want to bring some berries back home with you to the village and not eat them all on the on the trip so mothers would often feed the licorice root to their like children so they had some berries to bring home and stow away for the winter season is 
we never had like running water. If you had to clean fish or clean meat, you didn't have the luxury we have today of just tap, um, running water to clean it up. A lot of times these would be harvested if, and they would be used as like our kitchenware, like wax paper. Um, if you plant, um, clean game or fish, you would clean the blood off with the, um, with the um, ferns here. And even in the spring, they're fronds. The um, little seeds here, they're actually edible and highly nutritious. Um, everything would be utilized in the plant. Um, if you were to use the, the little seeds for consumption, you would take all these leaves off and you would keep this long stem here, which would be part of the material for weaving, part of your, your clothing and your regalia. So the, the general practice, the social practice of Aboriginal people is to never waste, um, to use absolutely everything and to take only what you need. But during a forest fire, one of the only trees that remains standing is the Douglas fir. And its defense mechanism is actually that it the bark is so thick and dense that when it heats up to a certain point it will actually explode off of the tree and this is kind of left and it's left alive and standing whereas a lot of the other trees won't survive through it. So right there is a, a western red cedar stump and it's actually um, you know you may not consider it but it's actually still living and it's still providing life. A lot of times, um, whether it's a tree laying on the ground or a stump, um, would, um, I think our people knew intuitively, but also what science has come to realize is that that stump may not necessarily get um, energy directly from the sunlight because it no longer has its main trunk and branches, but it still has its root system intact and um, they have discovered that the other trees will even support the life of a stump and they'll send it, they'll send it nutrients. Um, they say that the trees actually um, communicate also through their root systems and um, the birch tree in the winter, when it goes into hibernation, it sends all of its good nutrients to the Douglas fir tree. Um, so they have a whole network, they have a communication system I just, I'm awestruck myself and this stump is definitely a nurse stump and you see that it's um, got another tree which looks like a western, it's a western um, hemlock tree that is um, sustaining its life with the support of the stump. 